Hello everyone, this is Nevin Dawson with the University of Maryland Extension. Welcome to our webinar today. We are of course to talk about sheep and goats, a weapon against weeds, and a tool for controlling plants with targeted grazing. So a few technical things here before we dive into the core of the subject. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Please Send us a message if you cannot. Um, Ellen Green is kind of doing things behind the scenes. So if you type in the chat box and then hit that arrow next to submit question and click Ellen Green, that message will go just to her and she can help you out. Most of the time, any problems you may be having can be fixed by closing the window that you're looking at right now and then just opening it again. Usually that restarts that fixes any problems. Uh, you can use the text chat pod over to your left to communicate. And the technical files can go to Ellen Green, or you can email her or give her a call in her office if the text chat isn't working either. Uh, if you have questions about the content, you can type those in that box in the chat pod. If you leave it on the default, which is submit question, and send that, it won't show up for everyone. It'll come to our private presenters question and answer pod and we'll uh, distribute it and deal with it at the end of the presentation. If you'd like something to go to everyone, then click on that down arrow and highlight everyone. And then you also have access to status indicators. And if you see a little icon with a person raising their hand, Click that arrow next to them. You have uh, a bunch of choices there. You need to give us some input about speaking louder or softer, faster or slower, or just want to laugh at what we're talking about. That's your option for doing that. So I mentioned I'm Evan Dawson. I'm a forest stewardship educator uh, with the University of Maryland Extension. I work with forest landowners managing their land and um, encouraging them to develop management plans, that sort of thing. I work at the Y Research and Education Center, which is near Queenstown on the eastern shore of Maryland. And I'm with University of Extension, and there's my contact information. Our other two speakers today are Brian Knox. He's the president of Sustainable Resource Management and supervising forester for EcoGoats, and there's his contact information. To tell you a little more background, Sustainable Resource Management is a full-service natural resource consulting firm specializing in sustainable forest management. And he also does uh, logger and urban forester training. EcoGoats, a service that provides environmentally friendly vegetation control using goats for targeted grazing of invasive and problem vegetation for all kinds of landowners. Uh, so you'll be hearing from him in just a little bit and our Third speaker is Susan Shanian. She's also with University of Maryland Extension. She's a sheep and goat specialist located in Keatesville, Maryland, uh, which is out in Western Maryland. As her contact information, she's been with uh, University of Maryland Extension since 1988. She's an affiliated faculty member with the Department of Animal and Avian Sciences at University of Maryland College Park. She's also a certified professional animal scientist in sheep and goats. Uh, she raises registered and commercial Katahdin hair sheep on her small farm called the Lands in Spring, Maryland. Welcome to the Island Season. So before we get started, I'd like to do a quick poll. I'll move over to that now. If you could just click answers as appropriate. Appreciate that. Just to give us some idea where you're coming from and what your role is and what you're interested in. I'll also have a poll afterwards uh, to get some feedback from you. I'll give that another few minutes.
Okay, it looks like probably about everyone. So you can see uh, so too many people from Maryland, but a good number from Pennsylvania and New York, possibly because that's where a lot of the webinar was based, but that's great. Based as well. Okay, and uh, a lot of people with less than five ages. Good to know. Another bunch of people with more than 60. Okay, thanks for that. Back to presentation here. Okay, so first I'm just going to talk real quickly um, about invasive species in general. How they get started? How do they get started in our ecosystems here? Well, generally they're imported in packing material or filled water, and a lot of times they're intentionally introduced because they seem like a good idea at the time. A lot of them that were introduced were done so for erosion control. There are others that were done so because they look pretty in the landscape. Why are they so successful once they get a foothold uh, here? Well, they're easy to grow, so that it makes them a quick solution to a problem. Uh, erosion control is a great example of that. Generally, they're easy to grow in a uh, landscaping situation as well, so that makes them uh, in high demand for landowners because it doesn't take a lot of work to get them established uh, at their home site or business site. And a lot of people just even now don't understand the consequences of planting these things, uh, but even more so you know, 50 years ago or, or more when they were when they got their start here. Uh, in a way, these plants are similar to Superman. Uh, Superman, of course, came from planet Krypton. Uh, when he reached here, he found that what strength, the, the, the level of strength that was normal on Krypton was actually superhuman on Earth. That's kind of the way these plants work. What uh, growing and growth characteristics are normal where they come from uh, actually allows them to outcompete the native competition once they get here. So what's their impact? Well, a lot. Uh, just in our country, the damages and losses as a result of invasive species, now this is not just plants, but aquatic things and pets and pathogens, it's estimated at more than $138 billion per year. And the way they do that damage and, and our case, talking about vegetation, is that they, they crowd out the native species because they're able to outcompete them. That means that we have reduced food and cover sources for native species. It depends on the native species we're talking about. Sometimes it actually provides better cover, uh, but in general, we are we're reducing those resources that our native species provide. And then generally, we're also reducing biodiversity because where there used to be many native species uh, in a complex web, that single invasive species has taken that over. So here's just some common ones. Uh, if you're from Maryland, you probably recognize these from the neighboring states. Uh, golden bamboo, wonderful rose, and much ivy, mile minute, garlic, mustard, oriental bittersweet, tree of heaven, uh, phragmite is a, another big one. Uh, not so much in the forest setting, but on our shorelines, it's a common weed. So just to give you some idea of what we're facing here. Uh, traditional control measures. Uh, mechanical is a whole bunch of different ways to do it. Mechanically, there's hand pulling and cutting. It's generally a, a high labor cost or a lot of time doing it yourself. Generally not too expensive if you're doing it yourself. Uh, it often requires repetition year after year unless you're pulling the whole plant. It requires moderate access, and by access I mean how able are you to actually get into that site. If it's very steep or if it's all only for a rose or mile a minute, it's full. Mowing, a little less labor, probably a little more cost. It also requires repetition because generally you're not removing the 
plant so it just grows back year after year. And that requires high access. So that's probably not an option in real rugged terrain and not necessarily an option in real uh, thick brambles either. And of course there's chemical control measures. The labor required for these varies depending on the method you're using. Possibly a higher cost than the other methods. Again, you need some moderate access depending on what method you're using. If you're trying to get in with a vehicle, of course, you need higher access if you're doing it foot, you don't know, quite as much. And I'm dwelling on this access issue because we're going to talk about uh, this in terms of sheep and goats in a little bit. And there is also some possibility of collateral damage, so inflicting harm or damaging those species that are actually beneficial. And um, like I said earlier, we may not know the consequences of our actions, um, especially for chemical control, but for the changes we're making to the ecosystem, all, all types of these traditional control measures. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brian Knox, who's going to kind of give an intro to targeted. There we go. All right. So I am Brian Knox, and I do run a um, natural resource consulting firm as well as a um, <laughs> a, a wildly successful ex experiment, uh, which turned into eco goats. Can you hear me all right, Nevin? Yeah, you sound fine, Brian. Okay, great. It's it's kind of disconcerting to be di you know I'm unplugged from the main screen. Okay, so. Targeted grazing. I've got about five minutes here. I'm going to run through pretty quick. It certainly is perceived as being more natural. What could be nicer than sitting on your porch and watching the goats work? We've had people throw parties, big soirees, and wine and goat cheese parties while they watch the goats work. It's a lot of fun. It is a, there's a lag. Okay, there we go. Um, it's really great for public relations. People love it. And uh, if you've got a couple babies bouncing around on the job, you know, it's, it's, uh, it really is uh, something that people get into. These two were, were actually born on one of our jobs, Harold and, Harold and Jennifer, and you know they, it was crazy. People drove around for the whole neighborhood just to come see these two. But grazing also helps us reduce our chemical use. Uh, this is a site that was grazed, and then we went through and cut the bittersweet vines. That's what's hanging in the trees there. Some of them are quite large. Cut them, did a cut cut stump application of herbicide. The whole site was done with probably a one, half a Windex bottle worth of chemical. And, um, and then it's been mowed. So it's been kept open in the meantime. And it was almost impenetrable when, when we started. Drawbacks. Well, if you, if you look into these faces, you, you wouldn't believe that there were any drawbacks whatsoever. But, but the reality is, you know, it can be extremely labor intensive. Case in point, Tuesday and Wednesday I spent nine hours cutting and setting up, cutting a line and setting up fence for one third of an acre. So it, <laughs> if, if you don't want to be um, very active and this time of year sweat a lot, it may not be the job that you're really looking for. The other thing that's a drawback, be, expect to have poison ivy. Goats don't get poison ivy, but if you're around goats, you work with goats, you're going to have it. Goats are um, a pretty broad spectrum, and uh, so they, they really don't care whether it's an oak tree or Japanese honeysuckle. I, I, pretty, I refer to them as herbicide with legs. If it's there and they like it, they'll eat it. Some things they don't. Paw paw, they don't eat. Uh, Jack in the pulpit, they don't eat. They're not crazy about Ilanthus, but they will eat it if you give them a chance. The other thing we have to watch out for is strippers. Not those kind of strippers. It's this kind of a stripper uh, that is that is different. This is Mimi's mom, three, uh, previously known as, as goat number 105. She's definitely a stripper. She prefers bark to anything else. And there's a time and a place for a stripper. And not every job is ideal. Cost comparisons. Um, probably, I mean, if, if you're only looking at the 
financial costs, you're, you're going to see that herbicide is going to be the cheapest method out there. And by cheapest, I am, I am meaning purely financial. As, as Nevin mentioned, you know, we, we really don't know what kind of collateral damage comes along with herbicide. If you're looking at a site like this, which was a solid acre on a steep slope above the water, all kudzu, about four to six feet deep, the amount of chemical necessary to knock that out would have been phenomenal, and it was going to wash directly into the river going into the bay. So the choice here was, was to do goats. Every job is, is slightly different. We charge a daily grazing rate and a setup rate. And the setup rate varies widely from job to job. If you're, I mean, it can be, the cheapest we've ever done is $200, and the most expensive setup we ever did was $1,000. And it all depends on how much trimmer work, how much chainsaw work, how much fence has to be set up. That's the labor-intensive part of the job, but just kind of a wild-ass ballpark for short-term goats. Short-term being we come into your site and set up. We're there for three, five, six days, and we take them away. is somewhere between $1,600 and $2,000 an acre. This kudzu's job was a little more than that. <clears throat> I think it ran closer to $3,500, but it was a booger to set up. That's what I have got in this first section, and uh, I will hand back over to um, to Nevin. And, okay, uh, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Uh, we'll be hearing more from him in a little while, but, but first we're going to hear from Susan Chanian, who's going to talk a bit about animal selection and the factors to consider when actually getting the sheep and goats to use for these projects. So, Susan, you can take it away. Okay, so I'm going to be focusing on the uh, animal side. Uh, I need to go back a little on those slides. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about the kind of the, the whys and the hows about this. Uh, it's becoming increasingly um, popular to look at sheep and goats as, as kind of a, a, a possible solution to, to not only some of the invasive weeds but, but just you know weeds in general or undesirable plants in general or just flat out vegetation that we wish to control. And um, I want to talk a little bit about this, the specifics of that because I think it's, your success is going to be very important on with regards to the animals that you choose, uh, your containment, uh, how you manage and control them as well, because it can work really well or it could also be a disaster depending on a lot of little of the details that you got to pay attention to. And I sense that we probably have different types of people in our audience today. As a producer of sheep and goats, you can look that this is a potential uh, another method to make some money with your animals or even to specifically raise uh, sheep and or goats for this purpose. Or you may be coming from another perspective as a homeowner, a woodland owner, or, uh, uh, somebody who works with natural resources, is how can I employ these animals to control vegetation in a, in a more environmentally sensitive way and that sort of thing. So I think we've got people that are going to come from different angles on this. And so I want to focus, as a sheep and goat specialist, I want to focus specifically on the animals. Because in the end, what it is, is it's a bunch of sheep or goats out there doing the job. I mean, there's a lot of other things you're, you is involved with it, but in the end, it's the animals out there eating. And we want to have the right kinds of animals, we want to keep them healthy, and we want the program to work real well. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is choosing animals. And I'm going to talk about starting with which species, and then within the species, things such as the breed, uh, the sex of the animal, the age of the animals, the condition of the animals, and the health of the animals. Because I can cite out a lot of examples where I think uh, the wrong decisions have been made on some of these, particularly the latter two. And, and as a result, the experience hasn't been as good as it could have been. Having a little trouble advancing the slide. Nevin, can you help out? I 
thank you. Okay, first thing I want to talk about is why sheep and goats? Oh, sure, they're cute and they're small and maybe they're easier to manage than, than other big animals or even little animals, but why sheep and goats? There's a couple of characteristics that are common to both species, which is why we're looking at them. The first thing is they're both selective grazers. They eat a variety of plants. And there's differences within the species, of course, but they're selective grazers. They have a general preference for upland grazing. Doesn't mean we can't use them in some other situations, but, but those are some of the factors that makes them uh, very appealing. The variety of plants that they will eat that a lot of uh, other animals aren't going to be too readily to eat. And there's going to be jobs that are going to be better suited to goats, jobs that are better suited to sheep, maybe some examples where both species can be utilized. I often think if I was going to have a type of business like this where I would specifically focus on this is why I have sheep and goats, I would probably have uh, both species so I could deal with uh, different types of jobs. Can you advance the next slide for me? Thank you. Okay, let's talk about goats. And I think when we first talk about targeted grazing or whatever term you want to apply to it, we automatically gravitate towards goats because probably more than anything they epitomize a, a very selective grazer, an animal that, you know, we have this repu they have this reputation that they'll eat everything. Well, of course, that's not exactly true, but they do eat a, a much more variety of, of plant material than, than any other animal. We often tell producers that the best pasture is a salad bar, something where they have a lot of choices. We, ca we characterize them as a browser, very similar to the grazing habits of the white-tailed deer. They're also a top-down grazer, so when they've got even if they've got a pure grass pasture, they're, they're going to they're gonna knock off the seed heads and, and, and they're going to start at the top and come down. As I mentioned, they're a very selective grazer. Because of their anatomy, they're able to pick out parts of plants uh, that, are, that are the most nutritious. They can tolerate a lot of secondary compounds that other livestock, say cattle, can't. perfect example is condensed tannins. Uh, and which is a good thing because we have since found out that condensed tannins actually have a role in helping to control internal parasites in livestock. And so they can tolerate higher levels than, say, cattle can. They're obviously a very agile animal, and it allows them to, 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 to gain access to plants that, that other animals can't. Uh, they can reach very high growing forage. You know, they get up on their hind legs. Uh, Brian showed you a slide about a, a goat that was debarking a tree. That's one thing you got to keep in mind that they will destroy young trees. And depending on what the job is or what you need them to do, that may be okay, but you got to make sure that's okay. And, and they can not only destroy young trees, they can destroy trees with a fairly large diameter, five, six inches, by going around the bark. Um, compared maybe to, to sheep, which we'll talk about next, they can be a little bit harder to contain. Um, if you've got good fencing, I don't think it really matters which species you have, but we often always call the goats quality control because they would find, if there's a problem with the fence, they would tend to find it. They can be harder to handle. A lot of that depends on how you're going to handle them, whether they're harder or easier. Okay, let's move on to the next slide and talk a little bit about sheep. Sheep are also um, a selective grazer. We call them, categorize them actually as an intermediate grazer because they're, they're certainly grazers in, in respect with cattle and horses, but they will also browse and they, their preference for plants is actually forbs or weeds broadleaf weeds. That's their first choice in, in a pasture. If you were to draw circles around the types of plants that cattle, sheep, and goats prefer to eat, you would they would only intersect a little bit with goats preferring the browse, sheep preferring the weeds, and cattle preferring the grass. They're not quite as selective a grazer as a goat, but they still kind of are, are very selective in what they choose. And one of the reasons for this is the smaller the animal gets, the higher need it has for nutrition. A goat needs to consume a more nutritious diet than a sheep, which needs to consume a more nutritious diet than a cow. And so that's one of the reasons that they're more selective grazers. They're selecting the more nutritious plants. Unlike goats, who prefer to graze top down, sheep are notoriously known for having their head on the ground and grazing very close to the ground. Um, they don't like wet areas. I, I guess I didn't mention that with the goats. Goats don't like wet areas and don't like to get wet. 
Uh, sheep don't mind getting wet so much, but they will stay away from wet areas. Again, they're, they are known to be upland grazers if they're given a choice. In most situations, they are an easier animal to, con to handle, and they are an easier animal to contain. But they, have, they both have common characteristics, but they have very unique characteristics that, that make them suitable for, say, one job or another. Okay, now within each of those species, I want to talk about some of the specifics that you might consider. The first one is breed. And, and the first thing I'll say is there's not a huge variation in goat breeds. There's a great deal of variation in sheep breeds. There's many, many more uh, sheep breeds than there are goat breeds. And there is some minor differences in, in their grazing preferences. And then there's some obvious things like, you know, if you have a bigger goat, you're going to have a higher browse line. If you have a bigger sheep, it's going to consume more forage. Probably the bigger difference in breeds is their management needs and their tolerance to environmental stresses and disease challenge. There's goats that are more, uh, that can handle parasites better. Uh, there are uh, animals that are more tolerant of heat. Uh, obviously, if you have a sheep that grows wool or a goat that grows fiber, you have to shear it. So there are some varying management needs as well between the breeds. Probably the more important thing to remember is that there probably is much difference within a breed as there is between breeds. In other words, don't get too hung up on breed selection. In fact, what, I'll, what I would really say is the best animals for doing uh, Controlling vegetation would be crossbred animals, because just in general, crossbred animals tend to be healthier. Uh, they tend to have a higher degree of, of fitness, and so they're definitely well suited to this type of work. Next slide. Okay. What about the sex of the animals? You know, is that important? A lot of it depends on whether you're approaching this, well, I have a business and I'm going to lease out animals, or I have a herd of sheep or goats that I raise for production and maybe I can make some extra money or get some free grazing land by utilizing them. If I'm strictly doing the, the type of business where I'm trying to uh, do a fee-based grazing service, or even if I want to put my own animals out there, Females and weathers, or neutered males, are probably my best choice. They're going to be easier to handle than intact males. Uh, if I keep these animals year-round or, or do jobs in, in the fall, uh, uh, you talk about a pro public perception. Well, male goats definitely have an offensive odor during the, during the fall of the year, uh, so you would probably favor the, the females and the neutered males. And obviously, if, if part of your goal isn't to make babies, you shouldn't mix. Uh, you shouldn't mix the genders. You know, if it's part of your farm and your production system, you might have a buck out with those, and yet they're still doing a job. That's okay. But if you're strictly in the in the grazing business uh, to provide a service, then you don't want to mix uh, mix the, the sexes. You don't want them. You don't want hanky panky. You want them doing the the job that you have set up for them to do. What about how old they are? Well, generally speaking, the babies learn how to graze from their moms. They say that people eat very similar to their, to I guess how their mother cooked. Um, uh, young animals probably more likely to try something new. On the other hand, uh, lambs and kids have a hu much higher uh, need for nutrition. They need higher protein. They need higher energy. So for them to maintain their health and to grow, if that's part of what you need, you got to realize that they're going to need better quality feed. Uh, they're also going to be less tolerant of, of the stresses that they may experience, whether it's the extreme hot weather that we've been going through here recently, uh, or whether it's uh, parasites or some disease challenge. They're not going to be as tough as, as the older animals. They also don't really behave characteristically yet when they're young. They learn to, their herding behavior as they get older. So older animals do tend to be easier to handle, easier to move. When you have a bunch of, say, a bunch of females and their babies, they can be really challenging to move. And that may not be important, but, if it's a, it, but it may be. And so those are things that you need to consider. OK, what I mean by condition, and I think this is probably the most important thing at all, and so I'm going to talk about three things. One is horns, one is status, and one is their health. And I think these are the most important considerations. Um, do you want horn animals? Typically, goats have horns. Typically, sheep do not. They can be more difficult to handle uh, when they have horns. Uh, it, depending on, on whether you've got feeders or the type of fencing you have, you can have some entanglement problems. Uh, you need more space for a horned animal, whether you're talking about moving them in a trailer or fitting them around a feeder. Uh, 
you know, the horned animals are going to dominate the polled animals or the disbudded animals. May be important, may not be important, but just something to consider. Generally speaking, I'd rather not see horned and polled animals mixed in the same situation. Uh, it may not be a problem, but again, it's something to consider. Some of the issue I'll say about horns is a little bit of that's personal preference, but uh, we work with goats a lot here at our research station, and, and we have, uh, you know, so we have a lot of experience working with, with horns, and it usually requires special equipment or a good way to handle them, so it won't be a problem. Uh, what I mean by status is where is the sheep or goat in its life? Uh, if it's a kid or lamb, it's, it's, in, it's in the growth period. And even if you're not in the meat goat or meat lamb business, it's still a young animal still is growing and needs to, to get enough nutrition to grow. Maintenance, just your basic animal that's, that's either dry and unpregnant or a male that's not working or a weather. And then if we start getting into the productive animals, they could be in the early or mid part of their gestation. Nutrition gets to be real key as we move them into the latter part of pregnancy, the last month, the first two months of lactation, and then in late lactation, they're kind of curtailing off. If I'm strictly in the fee-based grazing service, I want animals that are at a maintenance level a bunch of weathers or a bunch of dry does. If I'm trying to incorporate, uh, again, the fee-based grazing along with a, a production system, I might have animals in some of the other groups. And I might need to do something extra to make sure their nutritional needs are being met. Probably the most important thing that's going to determine your success is that you put out healthy animals. You put out healthy animals and you collect healthy animals. Lots of reasons. Public perception even being one of them as well. The last thing the public wants to see is a bunch of animals that are on their knees or, or, or sick or something like that. And by the same token, you're not going to be successful if the animals are unhealthy. They're not going to do their job. You may suffer either losses because of the, the time and money it takes to treat them as well as animals that may die. So when you're selecting animals to do a job, again, whether it's your own farm or maybe you're working with another producer, you have a specific job you want done on your land, you want to pick healthy animals. If you look at this picture, the goat on the top, everything about her says, I do not feel good. She's got her head down, her ears down, her tail down, and she has a very rough hair coat. She doesn't appear to be in great body condition. Everything about the goat on the bottom kind of tells you the opposite. It looks pretty healthy. So one of the first things we look at is the hair coat. Much like a dog, it's a good indication of, of, of how they're doing. Their body condition, we don't necessarily want fat ones, but we don't want thin ones to the point that they might have a hard time handling the stresses that they might deal with, that they they might not get enough nutrition to, to maintain their body condition. By thriftiness, I just mean general health and appearance and things like that. Again, it's, it's real easy to look at the health of an animal just by how they carry their head and their ears. And um, you can often tell when an animal's just not right just by the way he carries himself. Obviously, they need to walk normally. There's a variety of diseases that can cause neurological or locomotion problems. We need to make sure we're not putting diseased animals out there. And, and some of it is um, some of it is making sure you don't put animals with diseases in there, and some of it they're common to the animals, and it just may be something you want to treat for before you put them out on a job. Uh, the primary diseases that we're concerned about would be uh, external parasites, things like ticks and lice, uh, relatively easy to take care of with, with uh, either with uh, anthelmintics or dewormers, or with um, some type of uh, insecticide that you spray or pour on them. The major health problem that goats and sheep have are internal parasites, uh, worms or coccidia. Uh, there are things that we can do. Uh, we can look at the animals before they go in. We can treat them as needed. The hooves can be a really important thing, particularly if you're grazing locations that are, that are wet. Some of the work that's being done with uh, Phragmites, for example, if those are wetland locations or the bog turtle habitats. You need to make sure you put animals with healthy hooves in there and may need to, to keep an eye on that. You may want to soak them in a foot bath before they go into those locations. Uh, general health of the animals, um, really the only diseases that are routinely vaccinated for in sheep and goats are the clostridial diseases, overeating disease, tetanus. Um, that's primarily of interest to me if, if you're keeping the animals year-round, you're not doing a thing where you buy and then resell them. 
from a public uh, health standpoint, I probably highly recommend that that you have your um, your animals vaccinated for rabies. Not that significant or important, maybe for a production situation, but where you have animals in public places, and uh, it's probably a good idea to have that done. So where do you get these animals? Uh, that's probably the most common question that people have. And, and again, it depends on the perspective of whether you're trying to hire somebody or whether you're, uh, you have a, a spot of land that, that you want to get taken care of or you want to develop this for your own operation. Obviously, there's companies like Brian's Eco Goats that specializes in this type of service. I think the industry is at the very beginning of, of this. I don't, there are people, farms, and companies out there, but there's probably not a lot yet. Um, and so you may end up going to someone, trying to find someone who simply has animals that maybe you guys can work together and, and figure a system out. I always say one of the first places to go is a county extension office. You can get a local recommendation. Uh, you can go surfing on the web uh, for businesses, for, for online directories of producers. We have an online directory called Sheep, Goat, marketing.info that lists producers of sheep and goats by state. Uh, farm publications, uh, if you wanted us to do a one-shot deal, it's possible to, to buy them from livestock auctions and then return them uh, when you're through with them. I'm not a big fan of free animals, um, but oftentimes they can be made available so long as they're healthy. I think that they can be fit into your system as well. Uh, controlling the animals, there's kind of different aspects of it. If you're going to do a fee-based system, you're going to need transportation for those animals. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about fencing because you're going to need to contain those animals on the job site. And we're also need, going to need to be able to handle them. A lot of people forget about that. Well, I can transport them and I can keep them in the fence. But guess what? There's going to be times that you need to get your hands on those animals. And so you need some sort of system of how you're going to handle them. Uh, there's basically two types of fencing options for livestock or for sheep and goats. Permanent fences and temporary fences. More than likely we're looking at the temporary or portable fences for job sites. But you may also have situations on your own place or some more permanent jobs where you could actually uh, do permanent style fencing. There's two types of permanent style fencing that are recommended and used in sheep and goats. The one of course is your traditional net wire, woven wire, page wire, American wire, whatever you want to call it. It's the traditional sheep and goat fence. It offers a physical barrier. Uh, generally speaking, we need additional wires, what we call offset wires, to, um, to keep predators out should they become a problem, as well as to keep livestock away from the fence. Because again, I'll mention a goat with horns, even a sheep without horns, if the squares are of a certain size, they'll get their heads out but not back in. A simple electric wire will keep them away from the fence. The other increasingly popular uh, type of fencing for, for sheep and goats is high tensile electric. And I don't mean electric, I mean high tensile electric, meaning those strands are pulled very tight. If those strands are pulled very tight and there's enough of them, not only is it a psychological barrier like electric fence is, but it's also partially a physical barrier. So you can kind of have the best of both worlds. These types of fences usually vary in the number of strands, probably as few as four to as many as 8 to 10. They should be of a certain type of spacing where the wires at the bottom are spaced much closer together and as we move up they are spaced further apart. Uh, typically in our, our part of the country we usually we recommend that all the wires be hot as we move into drier climates uh, even though we, I feel like we live in a dry climate right now but usually they'll be alternate hot and, hot and cold wires. The temporary uh, or portable fencing is more than likely what you're going to use on a job site where somebody is hiring you. And there's kind of two alternatives for that. Uh, I'm just going to generally call it electric fence, and this could be a smooth wire. It could be a, a poly wire, which is kind of twisted. It's like they're usually orange, but they're twisted wires. Uh, tape which you're increasingly being seen used in the equine industry, and also rope. They're more visible types of fences. The picture you see here is a single wire. Um, I probably wouldn't recommend that on a job site, but in this case it's being used to keep, to provide interior fencing. Usually you're looking more at three wires. Uh, they can be three different rolls, or they can be uh, uh, one, lots of strands on one roll. Usually uses step-in posts. They're very inexpensive type of fencing. Only offer a psychological barrier. May not contain goats and don't offer predator protection. The electric netting, which I think you saw in one of Brian's slides, it kind of looks like the woven wire, only it's electrified. There's different configurations, different heights. They come in standard size rolls. They're both a physical 
and a psychological barrier. They do offer protection against predators. Uh, again, I'm going to say one of the dangers with the horned animals, if they're not conditioned to this type of fence, would be getting entangled in, that, in the fencing. Handling. Um, how are you going to handle these goats? And I've just list some ways we do it. The most common ways we do it are the two that I crossed out. We don't handle them. Well, there's consequences not to handling them. Or we manhandle them. Lots of people think that God put horns on goats as a handle. I disagree. It's okay to restrain a goat by, the, by holding the base of the horns, but we shouldn't catch them, push them, drag them, or pull them. Okay? If we have a small number of goats or we use the same goats year after year after year, we can practically train them. We can put collars on them and move around. Uh, we can use grain as a motivation. Here at our research station, when we're working with a larger herd of goats that, that aren't pet goats, uh, we have equipment, panels, and we work with their natural behavior. And this is probably what I would recommend so that hoof trimming is not a major deal. If you want to soak them in a foot bath, you have the equipment to do so. Uh, the last thing I'm going to briefly talk about is, is the management of these animals. You know, we don't, we don't have time to get into re real details of how these animals have to be managed, but these are the things that you need to consider both on your own farm, obviously, but also on a job site. Number one, obviously the animals need water. Obviously. Okay? How are you going to do that? They need some types of shade or shelter. If they're grazing a wooded area, nothing beats natural shelter. Okay? Goats will seek shelter with one drop of rain. There are different types of portable shelters that you can use. Pictured here is what we call a polydome. Uh, there's porta huts. There's a lot of different shade cloths, lots of different things. You might, need to have, you might need to consider predator control. That starts with fencing, but sometimes that's not enough. There are various types of guardian animals, dogs, uh, donkeys, uh, llamas, you know, just things, again, you need to think about. From a nutritional standpoint, we'd probably recommend you have uh, minerals out there for them. If they're goats, goat minerals. If they're sheep, sheep minerals. If they're both species, sheep minerals. Might there be some su situation you might need to supplement, either because of the animal needs or because the site doesn't offer enough nutrition. And probably most important of all, I just want to keep hammering in on this health part. You need to keep healthy animals. Every aspect of this needs healthy animals. The two primary things that we consider are parasites, and keeping help healthy hooves. And with that, I think I can close. Okay, thank you very much, Susan. Uh, good information there. With that, we'll move on to the last segment with Habakkuk Brian, which is about making sure that the, the goats and sheep on the ground are actually uh, achieving the goals that you put them there for. Good his screen back on here. There he is. Waiting for that to come back up. Oh, while that's coming up, I'll answer a question that came through earlier. I'm working off two uh, Is there an official definition of invasive species? Okay. I, I imagine that different organizations have different definitions. But uh, in my opinion, I think it's really a, a value judgment to ask is this particular species Okay, Nevin, I lost you for a minute there, so I'm assuming you know, I don't see you talking anymore, so I guess I'm ready to go. Next thing I've got up here is uh, is coming up with appropriate vegetation, and um, Susan touched on, on several things that I'll continue to, uh, to work on. This does not seem to be advancing. There we go. All right. Uh, appropriate vegetation. Uh, usually where we get called in is where people have thrown up their hands and decided they can't do anything at all. Uh, poison ivy is is an excellent species that doesn't seem to bother goats a bit. They they go in there and will actually high grade it out 
above other other things. Um, so and they don't they don't get it, but but I always do. Uh, other species that we work on pretty extensively: um, Oriental bittersweet. And again, this is not advancing as quickly as I'd like to see it. Um, there we go. Uh, solid walls of vegetation, uh, bittersweet, uh, green briar, uh, porcelain berry, things like that where where you can't even get into it quite often are, are um, places where people will have us come in. I've got a series of slides here that is not moving through since I'm going on my desktop, so it's pretty slow. Um, uh, pretty pretty big lag time. What you're looking at right there is um, mostly greenbrier and oriental bittersweet. Uh, this site here is uh, very heavy to to bittersweet. Uh, here it is. You can see from the other side, it's it's a mountain of green, impenetrable to people. We do probably in most of our jobs oriental bittersweet, multiflora rose mile a minute take up the majority of, of the jobs we get. This seems to be moving a little bit faster now. Here's a bunch of porcelain berry that we worked on in downtown Baltimore. One of our favorites and most dramatic, I think, is kudzu. People lose control of kudzu extremely quickly. Uh, <laughs> it tends to be around here anyway. We get it a lot on steep slopes and near water. There was an awful lot of contaminated soil apparently that got used as in hurricane restoration work. And um, because of that, there's an awful lot of kudzu on various steep slopes up against the bay. This next slide is, is a pretty good example of places where goats are not ideal. We have a lot of desirable vegetation in here. There's a good bit of sassafras. There's oak regeneration. There's, there's some euonymus on the trees and some English ivy, but, but there's also a lot of things that we don't want to lose. And if, if we're not careful, the goats will just take it all. Like I said, they're pretty much um, herbicide with legs. This is um, trumpet creeper. It's a native species here, and it can occupy a site extremely quickly. As you can see, it's a, it's a steep waterfront slope again. And goats were really not a consideration for this particular job, mostly because, we again, we had a lot of things that we wanted to hang on to. There's sweet gum in there. There's red maple. There's eastern red cedar. There's some oaks. There's a lot of young ingrowth from desirable species. So this we actually went through and did by hand. Uh, as opposed to, to grazing it off with the goats. Wetland considerations, um, Susan touched on that. Uh, goats really don't like the water much. I've been told you can actually use water as fencing, but I haven't been gutsy enough to actually try it. <laughs> the, the notion of losing a goat hasn't, hasn't really been, been uh, very attractive. Here is some uh, fairly dry land Phragmites. We zoom out a little bit in this next slide. You can get an idea of how it, how it sits. And the, the Phragmites is down here in this section right, right there. We, again, this is on that same site we didn't graze. But this would be a pretty ideal situation for grazing Phragmites. Um, the University of Maryland has been doing some work with the effects of grazing and nutrient loading in the water. And, and everything I've heard so far is it has been very positive in the way that a goat's digestive system works. So um, Susan may, may be able to speak a little more on that when we get into the questions section. The next slide coming up is on preferred species. And I have found that the goats though they will eat a very broad spectrum of things, do have certain things that they, they um, pick out first. Uh, uh, first thing I, I usually see is poison ivy. Then they'll go in with the bittersweet. They, they do like multiflora rose a lot. Uh, Japanese stilt grass is a biggie. Greenbrier, again, it's a native species, but it can be a problem species, especially uh, around the water here. It's about the size of your thumb and, and uh, just evil thorns. Kudzu is a, is a treat, mile a minute. Uh, wineberries, they like the leaves. They won't browse it down all that great. Some species we do have to be careful with, they love sweet gum and poplar, uh, not only the leaves, but they also like the bark. Uh, maples, the oaks, red cedars they like. So um, when we're looking at a site, we do have to be pretty careful about, you know, what do we want to save here, what's desirable, and what's our plan to, to hang on to that. 
All right, next one coming up is on avoiding damage to desirable species. What, what sort of things can we do? This is a young poplar, and it's about four feet up. They've taken off all the bark. Again, if you, it all depends on the site. If you're trying to get a site cleared up or you have way more stems than you want or need, that's, a, that's an important consideration. Uh, usually once something's wrist size or bigger, I haven't had much trouble with them beating around on the bark. But first thing to look at when, you're, when you want to avoid damage is choose your site. Be very careful where you put them. And time of year also makes a big difference. Consult with a natural resource professional. Uh, EcoGoats has, has a real um, plus in that I'm a licensed professional forester and I'm on every single job so that I am there looking at the vegetation, assessing what's good, what's bad, what direction we're going. Uh, if we need to, we will write a, a stewardship plan or a, a management plan for the area with specific goals and objectives. In Maryland, especially, that's been very helpful as far as jumping through the hoops of working within the critical area with the um, Forest Conservation Act, etc. Fencing. You can fence them out of certain areas. Uh, the portable, portable fence is great. It's flexible. It's self-staking. It's easy and relatively fast to set up. You can also just use little exclosures within your paddock using um, um, just woven wire, you know, garden type fencing. Uh, the time of year that you put the animals in the vegetation. In springtime when the bark is loose and there's a lot of nutrition there, they're going to go after it. Goats seem to be very good at um, finding where the nutrition is and utilizing that. Also selecting your animals, as Susan spoke about. Different animals, some animals are problem animals, some animals are strippers, some animals are jumpers. You certainly do not want a jumper out on a job. Every goat I have is capable of jumping over a four-foot fence. They just, they're, they can do it. They have a lot of respect for the uh, portable electric mesh, uh, even if it's not on. And the danger is, again, Susan spoke of the uh, entanglement issues. If they get used to the fact that the fence isn't hot, they get into some very bad habits of sticking their head through it. And younger animals especially like to see what's on the other side. We use a positive-negative arrangement on our, on our portable fencing because we get better, better grounding that way. And I use our fencing as much for animal protection as I do for keeping them contained where I want them to be. We're in neighborhoods a lot. We get dogs. We get curious people. So we have a lot of signage um, on our jobs, on our fences. Always, it's always caution electric fence signs. There are informational signs like this that talk a little bit about, you know, what are these goats doing? Who uses goats? Uh, other, other, you know, other, other places that this is done. It's, it's very unique around here. Uh, I only know of one other commercial grazer in there in, on the East Coast, and they're down in North Carolina. There's a, a lot of opportunity if you're willing to work like crazy. We are on the job every day. Somebody has to be there to check the fence, check the animals, uh, give them their, their supplemental feed, um, and to check the water. Sometimes goats can go a very long time and never touch their water, and other times they will suck it down like there's no tomorrow. This, in the hot weather like this, they're going through a lot of water, uh, obviously, but they're, they're quite a bit like camels. And depending on how long it's been since it's rained, how much moisture is in the vegetation, that definitely affects the consumption. This is our setup with, uh, you can see the feed troughs in the back, uh, some water containers, our charger here. Uh, they've been in this paddock, I believe, for about two days, maybe three. That was a pretty much impenetrable wall of, of vegetation, and they pretty well knocked it down. You can see the browse line there. Um, we stock fairly heavily, and we'll, I'll put between, oh, 25 and 30 animals in a one-third to half-acre paddock on a job fairly well. Uh, heavy stocking tends to be like putting four boys around one plate of meat. Uh, there's a, I'm going to get this first gang mentality that takes place. So 30 goats for one day will eat a lot more than one goat for 30 days. 
And uh, so well, I like the heavy stocking. We use a 16-foot stock trailer, and you can pretty easily, you can see there's a fair amount of room in there. We do have a mixture of horned and polled animals. Uh, they are mutts. They are absolutely mutts. Um, every animal has its own personality. Uh, usually the ones that have either a lot of charisma or a real pain in the butt get names. And just like high school, if you... Uh, if you just keep your head down and, and don't make trouble, you just kind of get ignored. Um, but we do have quite a few that fit into both of all those categories. Uh, duration of grazing is coming up. Here is a, uh, a patch of forsythia in a neighborhood. And we fenced that off. And within 24 hours, uh, they had pretty well annihilated all of the forsythia. They kind of singled it out. and. Um, went for it first. It's going to change over here any second. Um, again, they, depending on the vegetation, what's on the site, they, um, there we go, they, they like this spot, so they hit it pretty hard. Uh, here's a, the next slide is, uh, is some bittersweet and oh, various English ivy and other things on the inside of that same. It was a one-third acre piece. We were there for two days and um, I'm waiting for it to change. There we go. This next picture was taken uh, after, uh, not quite the afternoon of the second day, and um, they had pretty well cleaned it out again. This was a site we did in um, downtown Baltimore for Druid Hill Park. Uh, we were brought in on a um, a job to to rebuild the this historic structure there. Uh, we were there for um, two, well, two full days. We were in and out um, on a half an acre. They really cleaned it out nicely. We kept it pretty well a secret until we were ready to move out. I was kind of afraid to have them in inner city Baltimore just because I felt totally out of my element, and it seemed like a very strange place to have goats, too. Uh, expected outcomes. Now, if you're looking at this picture, I, I was showing some slides to some, oh, I think they were fifth graders, and one of the kids pointed out that this goat has too many legs. Uh, it's actually several goats uh, stacked up together, but uh, as you can see, they'll stand up on their hind legs and will reach quite high. First expected outcome that I would have is you're going to end up with defoliation. They're going to take all the leaves and small stems from about, oh, six to seven feet high, and um, they're going to they're gonna gnaw them back, and they'll do that fairly quickly. This is multiflora rose that's been browsed back. You can see they'll, they'll take it pretty stubby. The next thing you're going to also expect is that, um, as Susan said, they, they will target flower heads and seeds. And so because of that, that will, it will help to eliminate the seed bank. Um, this is a um, mile a minute. Uh, very, very attractive little seed pod on it, but they will go for the seed first and, um, and get the nutrients. So on an annual like, like mile a minute, that makes a big difference. It also is going to uh, improve your access and your visibility of the site. These areas that you can't even get through uh, quite often, um, once the goats are in there, you can see what you're doing. You can reduce your chemical needs because you can do a cut stump application of, of only that vegetation that you want to spray. So I can go through, I can cut the vines out of a tree, use a very small amount of herbicide, and, um, and uh, get things under control. You will get some re-sprouting. Anytime you're dealing with invasive species, you are involved in a process. It is not a project. You're going to have to, the very thing that makes them invasive is what keeps them coming back. This is uh, bittersweet that it's after 60 days. You can see it is ready to wrap around my leg here uh, and ready to be regrazed. So repeated grazing, just like repeated hand pulling or repeated mowing, is going to be necessary. Even if you use herbicide, you're not going to get rid of the seed bank that's there. So even if you use herbicide, you're going to have to come back and do repeat applications. But with repeated grazing, you actually can exhaust root systems like kudzu, um, which, is, which is notoriously difficult to get hold of. You can see this site uh, quite steep. This is the one that goes down to the water. You can see our fence going around it. And our end result, what we really hope to see, is a bunch of new and desirable regeneration coming back up. 
this next slide. Some tulip poplar and some oak coming back. Got another one here with with more white oak regeneration. This is what we really like to see coming back on the job instead of invasives. Real quick, we'll run through some success stories here. You know, we've we've all heard the uh, exclamation of I'm happier than a pig in whatever. Well, for me, I think that uh, there's nothing happier than a goat in kudzu. Uh, this is a job we did on a private uh, gated community on an island, and um, we moved in. It was a uh, about a 30-hour job on a on a third of an acre. They moved in and um, immediately started to work on the um, on the vegetation and. Um, by the time I moved them out, the following on, on the day, I guess it was on the third day, the morning of the third day, it looked pre it looked pretty much like this, and it could be maintained with um, with a mower. Looking the same same job, looking the other direction here. Waiting on it. There we go. Um, there's still one more shot of that. We are up at time, and um, other than, um, I guess this, I do have a series here where we've got some job, a job we did for a uh, the county where they have a, a site that they do a reenactment camping um, for their, their camping zone for their their reenactors, heavily covered with poison ivy, and um, we were in there and browsed it off. We'll be back in there um, the end of July doing it again for them this year. But they can they can do a really fast job with that. Um, Nevin, I guess uh, if people have questions, uh, that's what I've got. Okay, thank you very much, Brian. Uh, good information. I apologize uh, to everyone for the audio problems we've been having. I've been chatting with people behind the scenes, and apparently, the result of some sort of network attack from China uh, on our main campus at College Park that's been slowing things down on our Connect server there. Possible that the recording will be better. I'm not sure on that, um, but hopefully, um, you were able to still uh, get something out of that. Okay, so let's move on to a real quick. And then we'll be ready to take some questions. Um, we can still uh, ask the question pod here. So take the poll. We do have some questions to talk about. Have a chance to uh, enter some more in a minute and we're done with this. It looks like most people have finished entering their answers in a couple seconds. Okay, thank you for that. That's very helpful. Looks like uh, people would like to see another webinar. Um, that's great. Okay, so we have that chat pod back now. You can continue to ask any questions you may have that you haven't already. And with that, um, start trying to take uh, some questions and answer them. Uh, let's see. Susan, you have a couple I think have been sent your way. I'd like to jump on and answer some of those. Okay, there's a question, let me see, go back to the top of my list. In populated areas, are there concerns about vandalism? Um, Brian could probably address this best, but I would have some concern, I know myself, because goats can be a very popular, and sheep, a very popular thing to eat among certain types of people. Do goats eat garlic mustard? There's certainly a, a record of them doing that. The one thing you know to keep in mind about what will animals eat, a lot's going to depend on what's out there now. 
they may eat differently at different types of seasons. They may eat differently when it's at a different stage. They will eat differently when they have different choices. It's not a real direct answer. How do you water animals in dry sites? Obviously, you're going to have to carry water there. Again, water is something that Brian could probably address real well. Are there species for which goats and sheep are unsuitable because of feeding preferences? Yeah, there are definitely situations water. where yeah. goats are more suitable than sheep, most definitely. Um, again, uh, the one thing I can't overstress is if you, there's certain if there's certain desirable species uh, in there, um, you're going to probably be more restrictive with putting goats in there. Uh, will goats eat multiflora rose and barberry? Again, there's you know certainly multiflora rose. Goats are sometimes seen as the answer to that, and they will do a better job than either sheep or cattle on that. But it will take um, multiple years. I find the question about is there concern about buildup of animal waste from sheep and goats? I guess that would be a potential one. And again, I think that's something Brian could address because he's had animals in in somewhat urban areas. You put a lot of animals in a small area, you're going to get a lot of poop. That's a reality. So um, you know, I guess that I, that's one I never really thought of, but there's certainly a potential there. I think those are the questions that got shot over my way. I hope I answered them to some usefulness. Okay, thank you, Susan. Um, Brian, I believe you have some, too, if you'd like to take a shot. Uh, Brian, if you could take a shot at some of the questions directed to you, that would be great. I'm not showing up as having a mic. There it is. Um, is there a is there a question pod where they are directed? The only question I have, the selected question, is what is the cost per day for goats? And that again, that depends job by job. We our normal grazing rate is three hundred dollars a day, depending on how far away that is for us. Very uh, tremendously. We will uh, we will travel. Um, if we're driving an hour, there's usually a little extra cost incurred on that. Um, I'm just looking through. Oh, uh, seeds on plants. Uh, goats' mouths are very good at um, at destroying seeds, so there's very little viability that goes through a goat's um, digestive tract. So we don't have to worry about hydroseeding. Um, Pretty much, there's there's almost no viability coming out the back end of a goat. Uh, the water issue, again, there's there's not much uh, because they're they're not there very long. Um, basically, if you have the uh, in a, in a northern climate where things die at the end of the year, you don't have any additional nutrient buildup from goat droppings that you wouldn't otherwise have from the vegetation um, at the end of the year anyway. Uh, uh, yes, Brian, there's another one here. Uh, have you ever experienced resistance from municipalities? Um, there's usually one grumpy person in, in any neighborhood, but mostly people love it. Um, we were actually um, ready to move into Baltimore and were told that I, w I was a sub to a subcontractor, so um, on the day we were supposed to move, we found out that goats are an exotic animal in the city of Baltimore, and it was going to require a special permit, and we were going to have to talk to the city electrician about our fence, and we were going to have to talk to animal control about the animals for all that, but the um, the city manager had already said, I love this project. This project is going to happen. We are going to make this work. And everybody was great. So I have not run into really anybody who has a big objection. Uh, I did run into zoning and planning in one southern Maryland county, which will remain unnamed, who said, absolutely not. You can't have goats in the critical area because they were concerned about it. And I said, well, both Baltimore County and Anne Arundel County uh, have embraced it and love it, and you know we'll just stay closer to home. Thank you very much. Um, so mostly it's it's um, just that it's not in the law, but mostly um, people love the idea. So I'm I think there's a lot of possibility for it. Any others out there? Uh, oh, here's one on plants that injure goats. We there. have a, a couple questions about 
uh, plants that may be poisonous to goats. Yes, so. I was just looking at that. Um, there are several lists out there. Um, uh, goatworld.com is a is a great place to look. Uh, Susan's uh, site lists several um, lists. There seems to be a fair amount of uh, discrepancy on what's poisonous and what's not. Black locust, for instance, is supposed to be toxic, but they seek it out and eat it and seem to do great. I've read research studies uh, specifically using goats to target black locust. So. Um, my experience has been goats, for the most part, don't eat what's not good for them. Uh, laurels, any of the laurel family, rhododendrons, azaleas, mountain laurel, um, are supposed to be toxic. I've been very careful to keep them out of that, mostly because if I'm at a client's place and they've got azaleas, the last thing they want is my goats eating them up. So uh, we stay away from that. Um, but very few things in the east that are that are major problem species. Uh, fencing, um, fencing runs, the electric mesh fencing is look, runs about a dollar a foot and uh, it's in 164 foot rolls. Uh, solar chargers, you're looking at somewhere in the $300 range. Um, you know, where you live is going to affect the cost of renting goats. Um, and real question is, do you want to keep goats around when your vegetation's done? We've toyed with the idea of kind of a goat starter kit with some consulting and, you know, here, here are your three goats or four goats or whatever, and if you want to get rid of them in the fall, you know, we'll buy them back kind of thing. Um, because it's not always economically feasible for somebody who's got a larger site to um, to pay the kind of pricing that, that that we get for the more boutique type type grazing, uh, most of our jobs are fairly small. Uh, if we get over a couple acres, it's it's really big. So a lot of ours are half acre, third of an acre, uh, one and a half acre, something like that. a question about poison hemlock. Uh, if you look that up on, on one of the databases, it'll indicate that it is toxic to goats. The thing you got to keep in mind about poisonous plants, if you look at the databases and the websites, you're going to see long lists of poisonous plants. And it, it's kind of like asking the question, what will goats eat? It's kind of the same thing because it depends on what else they have out there, what part of the plant, how much they eat, and things like that. It's not always a cut and dry situation. For example, right now when weather is real dry, you're more likely to have a poisonous plant problem when they don't have as much to eat. And if you're forcing them to eat everything, you know, you've always, it's something you always got to keep in the back of your mind. But poisonous uh, hemlock is considered to be toxic to goats. Um, I, you, you cut out there a little bit, Susan, but um, your, the supplemental feed and the minerals available to them also seem to have an effect on what they're able to eat and not eat from, from my experience. Um, oh, here's one about, uh, do you want to keep them in a herd or solitary? My experience is you never want to have one goat. Um, you want at least two. Uh, they, get, they do get, there's a very strong herd concept, and any time I've ever had a goat outside the fence, the only thing they were really interested in was getting back in. So um, two, two will probably keep them uh, out of trouble. probably takes at least four or five or half a dozen goats to actually get the true herding behavior. If you've got a couple, you want to treat them basically like pets and move them around with a collar. Okay. Uh, I think we've answered a lot of the questions, maybe not all of them, but uh, we are out of time. So I'd like to thank all the attendees for uh, sparing their lunch hour to learn about goats and targeted grazing. And a big thank you to Brian Knox and Susan Shanian for sharing their expertise with us. Um, again, we will make the recording available. I am hoping that the audio problems on the recording will not be as severe. Uh, it seems like the server is getting all the sounds, just having trouble getting it back to the attendees. Uh, so we'll send out an email to everyone with that link. and. We may be able to organize 
another webinar, uh, possibly a repeat of this one because we did have more people sign up than we could accept, or possibly uh, kind of a sequel with some more detailed information about um, how to really manage the details on the ground. So thank you everyone and enjoy the rest of your day.